good morning or good evening uh, to you. It's great to have you with us here. Uh, I see our participants are still making their way into the room. Uh, we are expecting a few more, uh, so we'll uh, allow them to join us as we make some opening remarks here. Uh, it's really great to have you with us on this webinar. My name is Marius Wistazen. Uh, I'm a member of faculty at the Gordon Institute of Business Science which is the business school of the University of Pretoria, uh, where I'm also the director of the Center for Leadership and Dialogue. Uh, it's my great privilege today to be moderating this panel uh, where we have uh, special colleagues of ours, friends of ours from uh, the Institute for Security Studies, uh, individuals from uh, different parts of Africa, different institutions, uh, some of our funding partners with us, and I'm going to take a moment to introduce them in a minute. Of course, the topic or the, the theme of our discussion here today is unpacking Africa's post-COVID recovery, uh, looking at uh, the options in health, economic and social transformation, uh, really an opportunity to unpack uh, what it is that we've discovered in some of our research and with our friends uh, to explore some of the key issues and key insights that, uh, that come to mind when looking ahead post-COVID uh, at the implications for Africa. Uh, before we do that, let me take a moment to introduce our panel for the afternoon or for the next two hours. Um, I'm also going to introduce uh, one of our funding partners here in a minute. But let me start with our panelists. Uh, I'm joined here by uh, Dr. Yaki Silier. Uh, Dr. Yaki Silier is, of course, well known uh, in Africa as an analyst. Uh, he's the founder and former executive director of the Institute for Security Studies. Uh, these days, he spends most of his time uh, focused on leading the African Futures and Innovation Unit at the ISS. Uh, he's also written a couple of books of late, uh, one called uh, Fate of the Nation, Looking at the Future of South Africa, uh, and the other called Africa First, Igniting a Growth Revolution. Uh, very active in researching and understanding the long-term future of Africa. And some of our work uh, today here will be hearing from Dr. Silvia on some of the research that he's done. Uh, a little bit later today, we're going to be joined by Elizabeth uh, Sidropoulos. Elizabeth is the Chief Executive of the South African Institute for uh, International Affairs, or SIA as it's known. Uh, she's headed the Institute since 2005. Before her current appointment, she was the Director for uh, Studies of, uh, at SIA, and uh, previously the Research Director for the Institute, as well as the Institute for Race Relations. So, uh, widely experienced, uh, well-respected commentator on the international relations dimension uh, of South Africa and Africa, uh, and so we look forward to those inputs uh, from Elizabeth. Also joined by Dr. Filani Mtembu. Uh, Dr. Filani is the Executive Director of the Institute for Global Dialogue, uh, who does a lot of work around Africa as well as within the BRICS formation. Prior to joining the IGD, he uh, pursued joint degrees, uh, a doctor and, uh, in, in politics with the Graduate School of Global Politics at the Freie Universität of Berlin. In Germany, I'm not sure, Dr. Villani, how the German is doing. Maybe you will will switch over and get some German today. Um, yeah, as well as the kind. <laughs> international studies in Renmin University, Beijing, in China. Uh, the focus of his dissertation was on the rise of emerging powers as sources of development cooperation in Africa, uh, which of course he got a cum laude for. And so we look forward to his wealth of, of insights and understanding. Um, there's much more to say about Dr. Villani, but let me talk for a minute about our next panelist here. Dr. Ahmed Orwell Omar. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is an accomplished international civil servant, an expert in global health. Uh, he has competencies in governance in public health, partnerships, resource mobilization, health security, including health uh, emergencies, the prevention and control of, of uh, non-communicable diseases, and so widespread experience in the health domain. And of course, in the context of the pandemic, this is extremely valuable. Uh, Dr. Ahmed was also, has also worked globally for public health and overseen the implementation of country-level policies in Africa, uh, working with the World Health Organization, more recently advised on the Global Coordination Mechanism for Non-Communicable Diseases, the Office of the Assistant, uh, Assistant Director General for Non-Communicable Diseases at the World Health Organization. And so again, uh, a wonderful panelist here to assist us in thinking about the long-term future of Africa in a post-COVID environment. Uh, but before we get to our panelists, and of course, I'll, I'll contribute as well uh, from the research, but before we do that, it's a great privilege to welcome uh, Hans Bühler. Uh, Mr. Bühler is the in-country representative for the um, organization, the Hans Seidel Foundation, that has enabled uh, some of our research and, uh, by being a funding partner alongside Humanity United. And I'd like to invite Hans just to say a few words uh, as background to the project and the input that we'll receive today.
Hans, over to you. Thank, thank you, Marius, and uh, thanks uh, to all participants for joining us today. And on behalf of the Hans Seidel Foundation, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this discussion on unpacking Africa's post-COVID recovery options. I think that we still all can't be, in a way, 100% sure what the impact will be, but we have, I think, a much better understanding of short and mid and long-term consequences of the crisis. I think also because of the first comprehensive long-term forecast, which uh, you have mentioned, Marius, and which has, be, which has been uh, formulated and drafted and launched by GIPS and the Institute for Security Studies. Um, and as you all know, many African countries uh, responded early and with remarkable communicative, communicative and decisive action, following also the advice of the uh, WHO. And most African countries have successfully delayed or reduced the spread of the virus. And while there is, of course, the ongoing debate all over the world, I believe, in regards to the re reliability of figures and test capacities, in a way, and uh, thankfully, the worst case scenarios for this year have not occurred yet. But as we said from the beginning, and I think this is also underlined by the study, this is not only a health, but especially also an economic and social crisis. However, it still remains to be seen to what extent this crisis also bears an actual opportunity for structural reforms to promote inclusive growth, uh, like it is being mentioned now, I think almost on a daily or weekly basis by experts, yeah, that this is an opportunity for the African and also for the European continent, of course, but in a way it remains to be seen if this opportunity is really um, being used. The global contraction in growth and combined with the effects of national and regional lockdown policies have, of course, a dramatic impact on the supply chains and business in general. This is also affecting international companies doing business on and with the African continent. And the first recession in Sub-Sahara Africa in the past 25 years will be particularly felt in Africa's upper middle income countries, like South Africa, for example. Tax revenues, and I think this is also being underlined in the study, will further decrease and this will have dire consequences in regard to resource allocation in the future. And of course, this is particularly affecting the citizens in the respective countries. Um, millions of Africans also in the informal sector lost their jobs. In the study, it is said an additional 14 million, 40 million Africans will probably live below the poverty line of $1.19 per day at the end of this year. And we believe that the SDG goal number one on the reduction of poverty by 2030 will in all likelihood not be met in Africa. More and more people are getting somehow hungry and some people are also getting angry. And maybe the coup in Mali is also a good example for this. And I'm sure, but I think especially as a, as a European as an, uh, and, and as a funder for this study, I think that we, we have to underline and express um, that Africa, and especially the AU, and Dr. Ahmed, I'm sure, will allude to this, has not been asleep at the wheel at all. Many successful initiatives on national, regional, and AU level to fight the pandemic and its consequences have been implemented. And the health systems, which were in a fragile position before the pandemic, did not break down in many places because of the consorted efforts by government, civil society, and business. And cross-sector collaboration on this level and with this intensity I have not seen before on the African continent. And we all should aim to ensure that, that such collaboration is continued, continued, developed further and institutionalized in productive, fair and inclusive ways as well. Of course, one of the most important aspects currently is the, uh, an effective response to Africa's emerging debt crisis. And also the analysis and the research, Marius, I think, um, alludes to this and gives practical um, recommendation in, in, recommendations in this regard. We believe for these fiscal challenges, good governance and political leadership is needed. So it goes hand in hand, of course. I think I should stop here, but not before thanking, of course, our brilliant speakers today, Marius, for moderating. Uh, for your availability and, of course, the authors of the mentioned uh, COVID-19 impact forecast at GIPS and the ISS and all of you joining us today. Thank you very much. 
thank you, Hans, and thank you to your team and uh, our other funders for your ongoing support in this important work. Uh, before I pivot to our next input here, let me say to our participants who've joined us, uh, today is not going to be a one-way conversation. We are going to have an opportunity to share as a panel, but we will have an opportunity to discuss these issues as a broad uh, participant base. We have participants from multiple organizations, various parts of Africa, uh, looking at this problem from various perspectives. So if you do have a question, please make a note of that question in the chat box. Uh, you can use that chat on Facebook as well as on Zoom. Um, and we will have an opportunity a little bit later to unmute your mic to pose those questions. And so uh, you can look forward to that. What I'd like to do to start as a, an input here to, to get us ready for the discussion is to share a short uh, video that we've produced. Uh, it's going to be about 10 minutes that gives a summary of some of the research that we've done. And this will provide a strong platform for our engagement and our discussion. And so if you bear with me here for the few, next few seconds, uh, I'm going to share this with you. And this will allow us to get some background and to see uh, at, a, at a high level uh, some of the research findings that we can then discuss in some depth. The COVID-19 pandemic is a global crisis that began in Asia, then impacted Europe and the US and finally reached the shores of Africa. Africa, however, was impacted early on by the economic effects of the pandemic and the lockdowns instituted by governments around the world. The pandemic is now spreading rapidly across the continent, placing health systems under pressure and forcing African governments to make tough choices about how to mitigate the risks and manage the economic fallouts. Gibbs, in collaboration with the Institute for Security Studies, undertook a 15-country study of the current and future impacts of the pandemic on Africa. The research involved a series of qualitative dialogue engagements with representatives from 15 African countries, as well as a quantitative forecast of the future economic growth, mortality, income and poverty trends expected in Africa as a result of the pandemic. The process harnessed participative scenario planning and used the International Futures Forecasting Platform of the Frederick S. Pardy Center for International Futures at the University of Denver to create a robust forward view of the impacts of the pandemic out to 2030. COVID-19 is not only a health crisis, the health impacts of the pandemic have economic consequences. And these, coupled with efforts by governments to mitigate the pandemic has serious social and political consequences for the continent's future. The study sought to explore the impacts of these knock-on effects on Africa's long-term future. The key findings of the study indicate that Africa's economic trajectory will be severely affected. The study results in a series of policy recommendations that will assist Africa in responding to the pandemic. Compared to a pre-COVID growth forecast of an average 3.8% GDP growth from 2020 to 2030, Africa's economy is now expected to contract significantly in the short term. Depending on the duration of the contraction, Africa's recovery is expected to take the shape of either a V, a U, or L-shaped growth curve. Under a V-shaped recovery, growth is expected to return to pre-COVID levels by late 2021. Long-term growth is expected to average 3.1% from 2020 to 2030. Under a U-shaped recovery, growth is expected to return to pre-COVID levels by mid-2022. Long-term growth in Africa is expected to be an average of 2.8%. Finally, under the L-shaped recovery, growth is expected to return to pre-COVID levels as late as 2023 and be reduced long-term to only 2.4%. While growing slower than before, Africa is still expected to outpace the world's GDP growth by around a percentage point. The slowdown in the African economy will reduce GDP per capita, a good proxy for average levels of income. 
GDP per capita may take three years to recover to its 2019 levels, or in the L-shaped scenario, may only get back to 2019 levels by 2030. will have been set back by between three and 10 years in terms of GDP per capita due to the pandemic. The economic shock from COVID will likely see the number of extremely poor Africans increase by 14 million people in 2020. While as many as 570 million Africans were expected to live in extreme poverty by 2030, up from 470 million in 2019, this number could increase to as many as 620 million in the U-shaped scenario, 640 million in the worst case L-shaped scenario, and still as many as 607 million in a best case V-shaped scenario. This means that between 37 and 70 million additional Africans will suffer extreme poverty in 2030 due to the pandemic compared to pre-COVID expectations. Instead of a decline of poverty as a percentage of the total population in Africa from 36% to 33% as was expected before the pandemic, poverty levels will now be stable at around 35% in the best case and likely worsen to 37% in the worst case our scenario. Under each of the scenarios, mortality in Africa is expected to increase not only from COVID-19 directly, but from the secondary knock-on effects of the pandemic, particularly the reductions in health expenditure that will follow from its economic impacts. In the V-shaped scenario, for instance, as many as 703,000 additional respiratory deaths are expected and just under 1.4 million other deaths by 2030 due to the pandemic's lasting impacts on African populations. These numbers increase significantly the longer the economic slowdown continues. In the U-shaped scenario, we expect just over 1.8 million additional respiratory and just under 1.8 million other deaths by 2030. In the L-shaped scenario, the numbers are slightly below 3.6 million additional respiratory and around 2.2 million other deaths by 2030. Overall, an additional 2.1 to 5.8 million people may succumb to the direct and indirect effects of COVID-19 by 2030. Because countries will experience sharp contractions in government revenues and hence a reduced ability to provide services including security, the pandemic will likely raise tensions and lead to new conflicts. This is particularly likely in countries with weak state capacity and authoritarian systems. The pandemic has highlighted weaknesses in the basic infrastructure of African countries, especially as it relates to the provision of clean water and improved sanitation. Only 40% of Africans have access to improved sanitation compared to 80% in the rest of the world. And only 78% have access to clean water compared to 97% in the rest of the world. African governments need to prioritize the delivery of these services, especially in urban settings where Africans live in high density informal settlements and are vulnerable to communicable diseases. The economic slowdown coupled with high levels of pre-COVID debt levels means that the continent now faces a debt crisis. As growth slows, revenues will be constrained and African governments will have very little fiscal space within which to maneuver as they seek to counteract the impact of the pandemic on their economies. This places additional pressure on their capacity to deliver basic services such as health, social security and education. Our research suggests that various interventions will be required, including an extended debt standstill. In certain cases, countries are in danger of a default and may require debt forgiveness and cancellation. Long term, African countries will need to transform their economies to be more labor absorptive, more productive and diversify away from their growing reliance on commodity exports and food imports. 
This drive to transform Africa's economies and accelerate growth is now crucial if Africa is to manage its debt burden and escape from slow developments. Finally, the pandemic has shown how a lack of investments in Africa's health systems make countries vulnerable to the burden of disease and how this undermines the overall economic and social well-being of Africans. African governments will need to significantly increase health spending and harness the innovations and interventions arising from the response to the pandemic to improve access to health services for Africans. The COVID-19 pandemic is a major setback for Africa and its impact is set to linger for many years. Africa's leaders need to address the foundational aspects required for development such as good governance, investments in enabling infrastructure and a productive relationship between African governments and the private sector. By harnessing the crisis to accelerate the implementation of the continental free trade area, digitization and move towards interventions that stabilize public finances, improve health, water and sanitation access, African countries can begin to transform their economies to be more inclusive and sustainable. This is crucial if Africa is to develop the resilience to overcome the crisis today and navigate future challenges such as climate change. So we would, of course, want to thank the, uh, the team that made that possible, that produced that, and continue to support us in the work that we do. Uh, I want to start here by pivoting to Dr. Silvia's. Yaki, you were the driving force behind of the quantitative work uh, with the with Tal, Kwasi, and others. Uh, of course, this is a moving target. Uh, COVID is not static. The economic impacts aren't static. They're dynamic and changing. And so given the work that you have done and that you continue to do, how would you approach this question of outlining Africa's post-COVID uh, recovery options? I know you have a few slides to share with us in the minutes uh, allocated to you, if you go ahead and share that with us. Uh, thank you very much, Marius. Yes, uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, share a screen and um, uh, allow that to, uh, so that we can, uh, yeah. Uh, let me just know if you can see that. We've got it. It's currently in editor view and it's now gone to presenter view. So you might want to switch that. Uh, thanks, Marius. So uh, hopefully that is now in presenter view. And um, the report concluded uh, the video on the four recommendations that came from our study, the debt crisis. We've already seen the situation in Zambia, the requirement for increased health spending, uh, the need for improvements in basic infrastructure, particularly improved sanitation, and then uh, the need for greater efforts towards economic transformation of African countries. And I want to focus my attention on that last issue. Um, the uh, impact, if we take the most likely U scenario uh, that was presented in the video, um, this slide presents Africa's average GDP per capita uh, from 2018 out till 2030. The dotted black line is the pre-COVID um, forecast of GDP per capita. And the um, orange line is what we th expect to occur without efforts to more rapidly trans uh, transform Africa's economy, economies so that we head for a um, recovery to the 2019 average levels of income by about 2027. Now, um, in the conclusion, I draw upon a recent book that I've completed called Africa First, where I modeled uh, the impact of 11 sets of interventions on the future of Africa, ranging from demographics, basic infrastructure, education, agriculture, social grants, manufacturing, leapfrogging, the implementation of the African free trade area, uh, greater peace or stability, so-called silencing the guns, democratization or better governance, and then the impact of external assistance, foreign direct investment aid and remittances. So what I want to do is just show what the impact of that would be if we were, for example, to look at um, Africa's uh, low income countries. Now, in this map, uh, the most recent uh, allocation of, co or, um, of countries according to the World Bank, Bank income 
uh, groupings, you can see the uh, countries, the low income countries highlighted on this map. So if I were to take those 11 transitions that I've just shown you and look at what uh, the difference would be in GDP per capita uh, for Africa looking out till 2030, 2040 for those 11 scenarios. These are for Africa's low income countries. It, uh, the graph represents the increase in GDP per capita for the, I think, 22 low income countries in Africa um, from the current path. So the different colors indicate each of those um, different scenarios and you can, and, and what the impact would be. And you can clearly see that green, the agricultural scenario as we would expect has the most positive impact on GDP per capita. Um, and so if we were to look at low income countries, that obviously is where we need to focus our attention. I think we all would, would know this. Um, of course, depending on whether you are a low, lower middle or upper middle income countries, the impact of the different scenarios differ. So uh, on the left hand side in this table, you've got the various interventions. What has the most impact for low income countries, the most impact for low middle and upper middle income countries. So as I've just shown you, agriculture, a focus on really going up the agricultural value chain uh, really has the most impact for low income countries. And then um, uh, industrialization, leapfrogging and the implementation of the African continental free trade area. If we were to do all of these things, uh, the impact on Africa's average GDP per capita would be that instead of recovery, re, uh, recovering by about 2028 to the average levels of income um, in the U-shaped scenario, we would recover by about 2025. So the dotted line shows the collective impact of those 11 scenarios on every Africa's forecast of GDP per capita, given the impact of the COVID pandemic. And um, uh, last slide, this just shows what the impact of that would be on, on poverty. So on the left hand side, you have uh, the percent of Africans in extreme poverty. And on the right hand side, you have the millions of Africans living in extreme poverty, in this case, uh, $1.90. So, uh, for example, on the right hand side, we can see as we, we know that poverty in, in Africa in absolute numbers is probably going to increase out uh, beyond 2030. But then uh, if we can really focus on the transition of African economies, we could see um, a, a significant reduction in extreme poverty levels. So, Marius, I've taken a bit of time to add on to the analysis that we've done that was published in our study, um, but um, I'll uh, stop sharing there, but hopefully that has presented an idea of what we think the impact of, uh, of code could be and what we could do to recover from that over time. Thank you, Yaki. And uh, of course, it's a mouthful. There's lots of data and lots of details there. And so let me remind our participants and our attendees here, uh, the chat is available if you want to post questions, we will circle back to those. Uh, you can do that on Facebook as well as here on Zoom, and we will have an opportunity for you to pose some of those questions in person. Uh, but what we'd like to do next year is go to Elizabeth. Uh, good afternoon, Elizabeth, we have introduced you. Um, I know you, you came into our meeting from a different one, so it's great to see you in the room with us. And uh, picking up from what Yaki said, of course, for Africa to respond uh, is going to require somewhat of an all hands on deck approach. Uh, that's going to require what one might call institutional capacity. How might we think about uh, improving or harnessing Africa's institutional capacity in a post COVID response? Over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Marius. And apologies for, uh, for being a little late, but I was in a discussion around how we can sort out multilateralism and global governance. And I think some of the questions and the issues that disc were discussed there are probably relevant for this discussion um, uh, too. I Elizabeth, I I'm sorry to interrupt you briefly. Uh, your audio is a little bit soft. I don't know if we can improve it. If we can't, we'll bear with it, but please. I will hold it here. Can you hear it better? better. Can you hear me better now? Okay, great. Perfect. So, <clears throat> I thought I would address uh, uh, your question uh, by sort of looking at, uh, at sort of two sets of, of, of questions here. It's sort of reflecting on why Africa was able to mobilize fairly quickly during the, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic. 
And then what does that mean? And, and, and at the center of that, uh, for me, is the importance of governance uh, and very critically, the importance of trust. But I'll come back to that uh, now. So if we just reflect very quickly on, on how and why we, we think Africa mo was able to mobilize fairly quickly and, and I think very effectively compared to other parts of the world. Um, I think there, there are four or five points here that, uh, that stand out. I think the first, and it's, it's true to say that over, over the last uh, several years, I think the African Union as an institution itself has actually uh, displayed much more agency. Um, and I think that's not something to, uh, to be underestimated in terms of the continental response. Related to that, of course, and I know we're going to hear a bit more about that later, but the role of the African Centers for Disease Control, uh, I think, who played a critical uh, coordinating role in, 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 in this process over the last um, uh, several months. Thirdly, and also not uh, unimportantly, I think the, the role of the, of the chair of the AU, South Africa, um, with a president that recognized critically, cr clearly the importance of mobilizing quickly and the importance also of doing it continentally and, and using uh, his uh, South Africa's membership of the G20 also to advance certain uh, uh, um, uh, issues that Africa wanted to put on the table, which we've also heard about in the video, specifically around, for example, issues of debt. Um, and I think, and recognizing the importance of, of, of the science community, that's also an important institution that we sometimes forget in, in these kinds of, uh, uh, of situations. And then I think the, the lessons that came out of specific countries who had experienced previous outbreaks of different diseases, but also in the South African context of HIV, some of these institutional infrastructure that was already there. And I think in, in the case of a number of countries, this was helpful in, in, in the response. And then I think lastly, it was just the extraordinary threat that, you know, we, we, we may have forgotten now what, was, uh, what we were seeing in February in Italy and Spain, which actually I think really mobilized all of us on the continent to say, we can't wait for this to happen. We actually need to do something because we've got weak, weak health systems uh, and insufficient capacity. But we also know that what, what we saw in, uh, transpire in the ensuing period is that uh, COVID in fact compounded the underlying structural challenges that uh, both the continent and, in, and, and countries faced, specifically the institutional shortcomings. And so what I want to just reflect on there is, is make five more points around the issue of institutional capacity. And when I talk about institutional capacity, I'm talking both about the continental ones as well as the, the national, uh, but I would also argue subnational. Um, uh, uh, and uh, non-state, non um, because we mustn't forget, uh, forget those, uh, those what I would call informal, often informal governance networks that are also important. So um, I think going forward in terms of how we harness this as a, as a first point, I think African countries and the African continental institutions really need to enter into a, 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 a process of review and reflection of what actually worked, what didn't. Uh, what lessons can we extract from that? But the first lesson, if I may be so bold as to say, is that we really can't pussyfoot around the issue of governance systems anymore. Governance systems have been, the importance of governance has been on the agenda for the last two decades in Africa, uh, but we really need to show the requisite political will, both continentally and nationally, uh, about me making the mechanisms that we have created to improve governance robust. And here at the continental level, uh, of course, it's the broader African governance architecture, and then specifically the African peer review mechanism. It's kind of, it's been resuscitated, but I really think all African states really need to take this uh, uh, seriously. The second point then relates to, uh, to the national level and governance at the national level. And this also requires significant political will. It's not like we don't know what we need to do, okay, but we lack the political will to do it. And it is about looking at this for the longer term and how we break, uh, how we break down entrenched political interests that actually undermine uh, 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 both the, the institutions of, gov of governance. Um, thirdly, and, and here I talk about, if, we you know, if we're talking about accountability institutions, it's about things like the Auditor General, our public protector, it's about parliament, it's about civil society and the checks and balances there. Thirdly, what we saw in the pandemic is that even if the central government is able at least to mobilize fairly quickly, the ability to implement 
uh, quickly and effectively is clearly lacking. And that's both at the national level, at the central government level, but it's even more apparent at the subnational level. So institutional capacities, when we're thinking about what we need to build up and where we also need to look for international cooperation and support is also critically at the provincial and local, uh, local level. What this also means is about the need for dispersed leadership. We tend to think about leadership at the, at the national level, but actually we also need leadership and mid-level kind of leadership and management uh, at, at, uh, at, the, at, at provincial uh, or regional and, and, uh, and local level. The fifth point I want to raise then is that the answers are not just, our institutional strength and capacity don't, doesn't only lie in the public sector. It's, it is the point about the whole of society approach. And here I want to raise two particular issues. I think, uh, we ha I think in some cases, countries uh, during the pandemic leveraged uh, informal or non-governmental institutional frameworks. Uh, Community-driven development is not a new concept, uh, but um, I think it was driven home by the role that community-driven development can play in, in helping government to execute uh, a plan in, in a crisis. And this thing can be translated into the importance of governance and development post COVID. Uh, we, we, we sometimes tend to, in, in Africa, sort of focus on, on centralizing the, the, the results and underplaying or undermining sometimes the engagement and the leadership role that communities can play in actually mobilizing around that. And lastly, uh, let's not underplay uh, the need to build up uh, our scientific institution, institutional capacity. And this is not just for the, a particular pandemic, but if we look and go forward into a, into a world where artificial intelligence, uh, cyber networks are, are, are the sort of the order of the day, uh, we in Africa also can't, uh, can't uh, ignore um, uh, the role that those institutions that we already have in, in our continent can actually play in helping us build up institutional capacity to deal with our significant, significant developmental challenges. And then lastly, maybe just to make a point that um, at, the, at the center of all this uh, is the importance of, 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 of a social compact uh, and trust. And it's about the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, engagement to harness uh, our ability to deal with the huge developmental challenges. The answers don't sit with one uh, central government or with a subnational authority. Um, we have to look, and this was, I think, one of the recommendations also made in the report about the role that we can, uh, that the role, the partnership that can be developed between government and business, but I would also argue between government and other sectors um, of society. All of these are institutions and we need to actually nurture all of them. Elizabeth, thank you for that. Uh, what, what felt like a masterclass in governance uh, on the continent was excellent. Thank you. Uh, journeying from the issue of governance through to macro, meso, micro level institutional capacity, and then building a wonderful segue here into what Dr. Filani uh, has been asked to comment on. Uh, Filani, given the need to improve continent-wide efforts, uh, we've asked you here, how might Africa enhance collaboration it speaks to that issue that Elizabeth raises about trust. How might we build the social capital that's going to be required in a post-COVID recovery? Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Marius, and I hope the sound is good. Um, We're hearing you think, clearly. So I'll basically, you know, center my discussion around those two very elements. Um, and the point here, really, is that the manner in which African actors um, address the challenges that are posed by COVID-19, that in itself is what is going to determine the amount of social capital that we are able to build on the continent, which would then affect the amount of resilience that we will see for future pandemics. Because I think it's quite clear that whilst uh, this is the, you know, the worst pandemic in a hundred uh, years, um, it's quite clear that it's certainly not going to be the last. And it is also quite clear that the challenges that it encountered us facing 
have essentially been, you know, accentuated by um, uh, COVID-19. I mean, the report really goes into, I think, some of this because one of the things that we must, we fortunate, I think, that and, and previous speakers have mentioned that comparatively speaking, the African continent has responded uh, rather well. It's avoided the worst cases of the health crisis associated with the pandemic. However, it has also showed us that we are certainly not immune to the economic aspects. The whole world going into lockdowns, how do we, you know, um, a, a continent coming from uh, the past 20 years where uh, probably the six or seven fastest growing economies were African. And with that trajectory, that type of trajectory has been impacted. So I think in enhancing collaboration, what we need to be thinking about is this idea of a multiple track approach in building resilience and finding solutions. I think what COVID has certainly shown, and previous speakers have also alluded to the scientific aspects of it, is that there's also been a need for engagement with society in finding solutions um, uh, and, and in terms of weathering the storm uh, presented by this pandemic. And that needs engagement at a societal level. It needs uh, um, uh, structures where uh, states can actually reach you know, and communicate effectively with people, but also form partnerships with social actors, um, both at a sub-national level within the state, but also non-state actors, right down to the community level. Because it's quite clear that no matter how good a strategy is well thought out at a national level, if you don't have buy-in, if people do not trust uh, the information that is coming from uh, authorities. If people are being easily persuaded and uh, by, you know, um, uh, disinformation, um, fake news and all of that, issues that we are all encountering. If that social capital is not strong, then you cannot have an effective response to uh, a, a, such a threat that was presented by uh, COVID-19. So in that sense, I think it, it's actually urged uh, various states to ensure that they are not only working from a state level, but that they are actually able to forge partnerships at community levels. Because the reality is that as our countries are reopening, we now rely on societies to act responsibly in the midst of a, 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 a pandemic. And that takes building, you know, that uh, social capital. I think in terms of social cohesion, COVID-19 has also highlighted uh, the, the importance of issues of social cohesion. And I saw in the video, you know, uh, the idea that with uh, dwindling resources um, and, 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 and heightening social tensions, new sources of conflict emerging, you know, uh, we are seeing this in different uh, societies uh, um, and throughout the world. And I think the societies that are able to sort of weather, you know, this storm and emerge stronger are the societies that would have been able to have greater social cohesion um, at home, um, but also who would have contributed also to building cohesion within their own regions also. And that means that social cohesion at a national, at a regional, at a continental, also at a global level. And maybe when talking of also of co social cohesion, it's important to highlight the issue of solidarity. Because at a national level, we will have to have, you know, greater levels of solidarity if people are going to become poorer, if uh, 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 um, societies are going to go through the types of economic challenges that are projected you know, in the study and in other uh, scenarios, I think the issue of solidarity is, ob is obviously going to be important. 
the last thing I think in terms of just building collaboration, it's going to be important for the continent to use its relations with external actors to build resilience on the continent. Um, one of the weaknesses we saw was the, on the issue of, um, um, of value chains. Um, because of the disproportionate power uh, that the continent finds itself in globally, is that we were at the back of the line when it came to uh, sourcing very important equipment. And I think what it, it's, whilst it's highlighted a weakness, it's also uh, uh, forced various actors. I mean, companies are reshifting the work they do. Um, they're producing for the local market, the regional market. You've got partnerships between universities um, and various actors, you know. So you've got a lot of innovation that is taking place to try and overcome, you know, that vulnerability. And I think the issue of building regional value chains is going to be quite important and also a, a, an important element of building resilience. And this has nothing to do with going against globalization, uh, going against uh, uh, um, the pre-COVID you know, model of globalization. But what it does mean is that if we are able to build greater resilience at regional level, so within Africa, if we're able to build those regional value chains, then it makes Africa's participation in the global value chains much more sustainable and much more stronger. And I think those are the areas that will become a lot more important. I mean, we know of the African continental free trade area um, and the potential that, uh, that, that it has there. But it's going to be important with that approach of a multiple track approach, engaging the whole of society. Um, to, to, to get that buy-in of those continental initiatives and work with external actors in actually investing in those continental uh, objectives. And that will build resilience. That will, I think, you know, in a sense, draw uh, a, a stronger uh, a social capital. And then just lastly, it is, you know, the way we respond, and I've made this point and I just want to emphasize it, if we, the way we have responded to this pandemic is, uh, is going to determine the level of social capital that we have in building even more resilient society going forward. Um, and with those words, thank you, colleagues. Uh, Filani, let me say that uh, you have made a very strong case, uh, not only for the way in which we respond, as you've emphasized, but for what I might here call the softer side of the issue, right? It, it, one might be tempted to look at it from a technical point of view and come up with a technocratic solution, but you've convinced me quite well here that it's going to take a more nuanced approach uh, dealing with the relational dimension. And of course, social capital is at the center of that. So thank you for that. I'm sure we'll circle back to some of those issues. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, Omar, uh, of course, at the core of this is the, has been the health dimension uh, it started as a health pandemic. It's become a socioeconomic uh, crisis and a socioeconomic downturn, which is going to require a socioeconomic recovery. But at the core of it, in some ways, still is the health issue. And the, the challenge of Africa's health systems and health challenge going forward, uh, what is your perspective of what we've learned and what we need to take forward in the post-COVID recovery? Uh, the floor is yours. Um, uh, thanks, and um, I'll share a few slides as we go on very engaging discussions here. I'll run through um, uh, some of the beginnings parts so that we, at least we have um, uh, uh, an overview of what the situation is like in Africa. And I'll touch on health systems and then end up with uh, uh, opportunities there. So in terms of um, the situation on the continent, uh, we are just over 1.5 million cases right now. Uh, the good thing is that our recovery rate is really good. Our case fatality rate is still just about 2.4 or there about percent. Um, and um, yeah, the, the set of um, uh, graph on the right there, it tells us that we, it took us about 133 days to get to the first half a million on the continent. Then the second half a million took only 30 days. That is where we were peaking 
in as far as numbers is concerned. And now we are seeing a slowdown. The third half a million has taken us just over 58 days. So um, essentially uh, we have peaked. Um, the numbers are coming down a bit, uh, but uh, it is not time to, to sit back and relax uh, because this virus is very tricky and uh, very cunning. When you think you have it, uh, suddenly it has you. Uh, but for sure, um, uh, we have um, uh, seen uh, the numbers starting to slow down. And allow me here to say that at the beginning of this pandemic, the projections for Africa were horrible figures. Um, and I think there was the assumption that um, we'll just sit back and wait, we'll not do much. And whatever we are going to do is going to be purely based on someone else's ideas and plans. But we took the matters into our own hands. And as Africa CDC, Africa Union, we are quite proud of the, uh, the role that we have played. Um, now, to stick still with the epidemiological um, uh, situation, you'll see that from some time in, uh, towards the end of July, um, the, the, the graph started to come down. Um, but this belies the details, um, um, which I will show in the next set of slides. If you look at Africa, which is divided into five um, regions, you'll see that although we are dropping, and quite significantly in uh, many uh, of the regions, the four regions, the Northern Africa region, it's still rising. So it's very important to unpack Africa. Indeed, sometimes it is useful to unpack a country so that you know where your efforts should be in terms of getting um, the right um, uh, actions being taken uh, within the right population. But if we look at country by country basis, Africa still has a fighting chance. Uh, over 24 countries have less than 5,000 cases. Uh, this means that we can really be able to uh, make some good uh, action in these countries to keep the numbers low. If we look at um, countries below 10,000 cases, um, uh, the total is 36. So more than half the countries on the, on the continent still has less than 10,000 cases. So there's a very good opportunity uh, to be able uh, to work um, uh, towards uh, protecting even more uh, Africans from um, uh, getting uh, infected. Now, if you look at the trends over the last two weeks, 25 countries, we are seeing a decrease in uh, new cases. Um, 17 countries, we are not seeing any change. Uh, and only 12 countries are we seeing an increase. So it also means that apart from those 36 or so countries that are below 10,000 cases, we have 25 countries where the numbers are coming down. So the continent can actually uh, uh, be able uh, to begin to get a grip uh, of this particular uh, uh, pandemic. Um, to shift quickly to uh, the level of testing, um, we had a target that by the end of October, we will have tested 10 million. We reached that target um, sometime in the middle of August, and now we are aiming for 20 million tests by the end of October. Um, and um, we think we'll still be able to make uh, uh, that particular target. Testing is being increased, and this is because um, we are coordinating a very huge effort by our, our countries on the continent to increase uh, testing at local level. Now, let me shift to the health systems, um, particularly in the context of COVID-19. Uh, we um, developed the strategy for COVID-19 outbreak uh, in, our, in February, when the first case was uh, uh, confirmed in uh, Egypt, February 14th. Uh, and our strategy has two main goals, uh, preventing severe illness and death, uh, as well as minimizing the social disruptions including economic consequences. And I think from the, the study that this report is providing, um, uh, really uh, we picked uh, probably the right things to do in the situation of a pandemic like this. And how are we doing that? We are doing that in two ways. One is we are coordinating efforts, not just of member states, but also of all the players uh, on the continent. And secondly, we are insisting on using evidence-based practices so that we know that when we do something, it is going to work. Uh, there is no room or opportunity for trial and error. So evidence base is extremely uh, critical. Now, if we look at the challenges that are affecting the, uh, the health systems in Africa, uh, um, and I think a few of these have already been touched on, underfunding. 
and underfunding due to different reasons. Um, some countries are just uh, poor, they don't have enough money. Others are using their money uh, for things other than the health sector. Uh, but generally, there is a lot of underfunding on the continent. Second is our human resource is uh, meager. Um, we have few, the few are overworked. And uh, those who are a little good <laughs> um, get poached by international organizations and other countries. So it, it compounds um, uh, the skill level that we have, in particular in our public health uh, system. So human resource is low. Thirdly is poor leadership, uh, right from the clinic level all the way uh, to the policy level. On the continent, we have a huge problem with this and the health sector really needs uh, to focus on how to improve uh, leadership and management um, in this uh, post-COVID era. Then there is insufficient political commitment. We have a lot of um, proclamations that are made, declarations, commitments that are signed. But then when it comes uh, to the time of implementing, we find many countries are falling short. And um, the proportion of budget that goes to the health sector is a very good example. Very few countries have reached the Abuja declaration levels of 15%. Then, of course, when you are underfunded and uh, you have uh, relatively poor leadership, you don't get a very good health infrastructure. It is poor on the continent. It is weak. Um, and in that context, COVID arrived um, uh, to challenge um, uh, what uh, we have on the continent. But a few things did work. And one key thing that worked is that public health measures came in early and were enforced sometimes rather vigorously by governments. And uh, some of those, uh, we know all of them, you know, wash your hands, wear your mask, uh, social distance, ETC. But these did work. And uh, this is part of the success that Africa has had because we started early and we did the right things, which we uh, were clearly uh, evidence-based um, and this helped to keep the numbers low. Now, let me focus a bit on uh, probably the core of um, our discussions tonight. Um, looking at um, health systems in the post-COVID-19 uh, era. Uh, it's very important that um, we build a resilient health system. I think uh, literally every uh, panelist has mentioned this. But how do we do that? Uh, we need to step out of um, uh, these silos of this is private and this is public because we are serving the same people. We are serving the same continent and we need to build better public private partnerships uh, so that we can be able to improve uh, the levels of trust and um, uh, health outcomes on the continent. But these partnerships need to be established on the basis of planning and planning to be effective, not um, uh, just partnering to be seen to be uh, partnering. Secondly is we need very targeted interventions. What we've learned uh, during the last seven, eight months is that uh, there are things that work very well in Africa and there are things that won't work in Africa. So we need to be very targeted in the way that uh, we are approaching our interventions and we pick those things that are definitely going to work on the continent. We document them well, we analyze the data that we have and therefore we improve uh, the next time that uh, an outbreak or a pandemic comes. Thirdly is we need to increase advocacy so that the commitments that are being made to the health systems are actually being delivered. Um, if we only talk and then we don't hold our policy makers and decision makers to account, then we miss the opportunity to improve the health system. And finally is capacity building. Our health workers are overworked, uh, they are underpaid, and, um, and they are few. Um, this means that we really need to look critically at which cadres do we need on the continent and how do we motivate them uh, with a, an appropriate work environment and uh, money in their pockets, of course, uh, so that they stay and they don't go out of the continent. Um, uh, looking into the future, what are we going to do? Um, some of the things that we are doing as Africa CDC and Africa Union uh, include um, the vaccine um, space which is really going to ensure that we can be able to reach the levels of immunity that can allow us to do our work uh, comfortably. Um, and uh, to do this, we have developed a strategy which has these three broad areas. Um, how do we accelerate our involvement in vaccine development? Um, how do we ensure that we have access to sufficient quantities? And how do we ensure that we can deliver them to the hardest parts of the continents to reach? 
Um, we uh, are not doing this on our own. Um, this has been done um, with um, endorsements from the highest levels of the continent. Um, the African Union heads of state, uh, the Bureau has um, uh, been very, very clear and consistent in providing us with guidance on what we need to do. And this strategy is bearing fruit. As you can see, um, we have more and more countries, about eight now are actively involved in clinical trials. And we, we are uh, working very hard to have more countries join this. That way, we have a very well represented continent in as far as these trials are concerned. But we need money to be able to deliver vaccination because having a vaccine is one thing, but getting um, individuals being vaccinated is another. Um, being a continent of 1.2, 1.3 billion people, we are going to need significant amounts of doses. And uh, we estimate that um, even at the bare minimum, we'll be talking about 10 or 15 billion, but really the reality is double that is what we may be able to need. And this is extremely important because of the experiences we've had. Uh, if you reflect back on uh, what happened during the HIV um, uh, uh, pandemic, where, 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 I mean, the, the, uh, where, where it was starting, if you look at what happened in the US around um, uh, uh, 1996 or thereabout, we got um, uh, medication being made available. But that was not made uh, easily accessible on the continent for about 10 years. And in those 10 years, we lost nearly 12 million people on the continent. We should not repeat that mistake. And that is what we are working at, at Africa CDC to ensure that um, as soon as any vaccine, any therapy is uh, made available uh, anywhere in the world, that Africa gets its rightful share and it gets its rightful share now, not 10 years later, uh, because we don't want to repeat uh, the mistakes of the past. Now, if you look at the, um, uh, the situation today, in May, there was lockdown literally throughout the continent. But today, you can see that the continent is opening up, borders are being um, uh, accessed more easily, um, and uh, it means that people are starting to move. And with movement, the virus is also going to start moving. And we need to be very awake uh, to that because it can uh, disorganize the, the gains that we have made. To that end, we have uh, the campaign of saving lives, saving economies and livelihoods on the continent, targeting um, travel, targeting uh, protecting the economy, including local production, and targeting uh, schools uh, so that we can be able to have our lives back in a more organized uh, way. Um, we have also and, uh, started working um, uh, digitally so that we can be able to get um, those certificates uh, for COVID-19, uh, when they say negative, they are truly negative. And we have a portal that we have launched um, uh, a few days back um, to ensure that um, all um, the, um, uh, the countries that are participating, the labs that are participating, it, it becomes easy to know what are the requirements that you need to travel to country X if you're coming from country Y. And um, uh, the platform also captures the details of which labs have been uh, um, uh, cleared to do uh, testing so that we don't get fake tests uh, being shared um, at the airport. So uh, in terms of key messages from me, uh, there will be three. One is let's use this pandemic as an opportunity to strengthen the health system. And um, we, we, can, we can do this now because our policymakers um, our uh, collaborators, partners have very heightened attention to the COVID-19 um, situation and resources are, be are being made a little bit more available than before. So we should not waste the outbreak. We should not waste the pandemic. Let's use it to strengthen the health system. Second is that to, to achieve this, we must leverage on what we have on the continent, whether it is uh, expertise, it is facilities, it is organizations, it is individual capacity, we need to uh, leverage on those and ensure that we are tackling the, the health information system, we are tackling the issue around the public uh, uh, health workforce, we are ensuring that our lab systems are networked properly and can be able to be used from country to country. Um, we are securing our supply chain, both through local production and strategic um, partnerships with those who are producing what we can't produce elsewhere in the world, and we have access 
to essential medicines and vaccines. And finally, is sustainability needs to be worked into what we are doing. We must get domestic resources being used more effectively rather than waiting for um, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, partners to come in and uh, um, uh, support our work. And we have the resources. We just need to be able to allocate them appropriately um, uh, during this pandemic to avoid the same mistakes that uh, we will have done uh, much earlier. But for COVID, I think we've done well. We just need to improve on it. I uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And I noticed uh, my colleague there in the chat saying, Alala Africa, uh, we've done certain things really well here in, this, in response to the pandemic. And uh, certainly a wonderful presentation. You have participants uh, asking us for a copy of the presentation uh, and commending you for that, what is a really granular, robust view. So colleagues, we've had an opportunity to hear from the panelists at a first round. Uh, we've looked at the issue from a structural point of view, from a governance point of view, from a social capital point of view, from a health point of view. Uh, what I'd like to do here is to pivot to each panelist with one follow-on question before we open the floor for Q&A. Uh, let me remind participants to please put their questions in the chat. You can use the Zoom or the Facebook chat to do so. Uh, but let me start by asking uh, Dr. Suliers here a question. Yaki, your work typically looks at the structural dimensions, you know, across the economic, political, social, and you produce this wide ranging uh, insight into the nature of what one might call Africa's current path and alternative paths for the, for the continent. But of course, within all of those, there sometimes are one or two key areas that are crucial for the continent to get out of the rut or to change direction. One might say to, uh, to say it can't be business as usual in this particular area. If you had to put your finger on one or two areas that are going to be crucial for Africa to address as it comes out of this pandemic, where would you put that emphasis? What would you say the focus should be? Thanks, Marius. I spoke at length through the previous uh, previous response, so I'll, I'll keep it very short. Um, uh, the first point is that when you deal with structural uh, drivers, as I generally do, um, that's one thing. Um, but uh, dealing with what we refer to as agency, the role of leadership, uh, the role of good gov uh, of yeah, of uh, a, a um, governing elite that is really orientated towards uh, growth inclusive growth is a very difficult model. So the first thing is really the orientation of our governing elite. And COVID presents us with many challenges in this regard because it is going to reduce government revenues and it's going to require greater determination uh, from our, our leadership. But, you know, I presented these 11 scenarios from a structural point of view, and I tried at the end to point to the fact that if you're a low-income country, you need to focus on agriculture, and for the rest, you really need to focus on leapfrogging, manufacturing, and the implementation of the African continental free trade area. Never before has Africa embarked upon the kind of uh, uh, looking towards a future where we look at trade integration. Um, the world is changing and Africa needs to run much faster, even if it is only to stay in its, its current uh, position. So those are the areas that I think are, are critical, starting with the issue of leadership and the orientation of the governing elite. Um, and then the, those broad areas that, uh, that I think are absolutely critical. If we don't get that right, then um, it's going to be uh, difficult to get any of the others right. Thank you, Yaki, putting your finger there on a critical issue. And uh, the second question I have here for Dr. Filani, it in fact links to what I had hoped to ask, comes from our, uh, our chat. I see Junia Ngulube uh, posting it here. Uh, Junia, good to have you on the call with us as a participant. And the question he asks here is the pandemic has driven home the importance of collaboration across the continent. Well done. How do we take the sense of urgency and collaboration specifically around the Africa tree, the free trade area uh, and how do we uh, ensure that trade in Africa with itself can be expanded? Uh, Dr. Filani, your thoughts on energizing the momentum around that agenda? I think actually, if we look at, uh, I mean, the African continental free trade area falls within uh, a broader framework of Agenda 2063. Um, and I think it's actually already touted and, and, and acknowledged that it is actually one of the initiatives that have been 
you know, implemented with a great amount of political will. I mean, you saw that things moved relatively fast. I mean, in terms of the, 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 you know, all the signatories coming on board and so forth, I think it might have missed its deadline by a, a, a few months, but I think there has been a lot of political will. There's an acknowledgement within the continent that it is not sustainable to have a continent where you're only, only 20% of your trade uh, at, at, at the most is intra-Africa. And that is just not sustainable. It just tells you that there's a whole um, potential market that we are still not utilizing on the continent. And if we're going to actually build resilience, this is one of the areas that will be one of the most important because it also speaks to this idea of building regional value chains, of actually supporting you know, um, manufacturing. I mean, we understand that, we understand that, you know, the continent's population is going to double. Now, if the population is going to, to, to double, we have to make sure that we are creating the necessary skills, that we're creating the necessary jobs. So implementing the continental free trade area, one of the good things about it is that it's not only driven by the fact that it's a good idea, by the fact that it's Pan-African, um, it's driven by necessity. It has to get done because if we don't put the necessary political will into issues like the African continental free trade area, then we know that the continent will be worse off uh, for it. And, 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 and I think it is important to acknowledge that, you know, reaching, um, you know, goals such as the implementation of the continental free trade area, it falls within also as part of this long-term planning, but then that's broken down into smaller 10-year periods. So we know that the continent has, you know, your so-called um, catalyst uh, uh, um, uh, projects within the, 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 the broader Africa uh, uh, Agenda 2063. And I think this idea and realization that here we were encountered with a pandemic and we had not developed sufficiently our regional value chains in order to be able to, to, to actually make some of the products that we needed to make. And because of the imbalanced nature of, 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 of global politics, Africa found itself essentially on the outskirts. And this realization is driving home the need to build these regional value chains. And one of the tools towards that is the African continental free trade area. There is sufficient political buy-in. And I think we just need to capitalize from the political buy-in that is already there, but also use it to address a weakness in terms of Africa's regional integration. We need to overcome this weakness where the regional integration agenda is driven at, a, 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 at, at the heads of states, at the foreign ministers, and at, at a sort of, uh, sort of national level. And we need to ensure that we find mechanisms on the continent so that as we drive you know, regional integration, we're also encouraging people-to-people -people relations on the continent. We, we're encouraging the partnering of research organizations within the continent, of civil society organizations within the continent, so that the regional integration agenda um, doesn't suffer from the critique that it is driven from the top, but that it also has the sufficient buy-in from the bottom up. And that will drive change um, over time and keep the momentum. Um, but that's all really about capitalizing from the political will that is already in existence. Thank you, Filani, for that great answer. And uh, I'd not seen the connection as starkly as you put it uh, between the nature of our trade relations, our vulnerability in a pandemic to supply chain needs and and the, the, the power imbalances that Africa has with the rest of the world and how resolving the one, in fact, resolves the other. So thank you for that. Uh, Elizabeth, if I could come to you. Uh, my question to Yaki was, uh, from a structural point of view, 
what's the low hanging fruit? What's the, the burning platform that we must focus on to unlock a new path for the continent? A similar question for you around governance on the continent. Uh, we have these plans, Africa 2063. We have these institutions, Africa Union. Where in your mind is the logjam uh, that if we removed it would accelerate our ability as a continent to do these things, as Falani put it, to execute on these, these wonderful plans? Where should we put the focus to remove some of those barriers? I think the, the challenge with, with governance is that you actually have to, while we have the superstructure in the AU and in the, in the mechanisms and frameworks of the APRM and, and, and so on and so forth, and those help to facilitate coordination. What, what is significantly lacking in many parts of the continent is the effective governance and, and capable states at the national level. Those are not low hanging fruits by any stretch of the imagination. Building up effective governance it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, in the same way that building up uh, effective value chains doesn't happen, but you know, you've got to start. You actually got to start now. So for me, um, you know, you could have the coordinating superstructure like we had and the kind of technical support, for example, that the CDC has, has provided and also working with the WHO. But if you are lacking the systems at your national level and the systems are much more than individuals. So it's, it's important to have individuals. It's important to have physicians, to have doctors, to have nurses, to have all of these health professionals. But they have to operate within a, within a framework, within a governance framework and a system that can deliver. And that's been lacking. And so we have to start there. And we don't necessarily have to start from scratch, but actually we have to, if, if, the, if the COVID pandemic does one thing, uh, and that is to highlight that actually, you know, we have done so well under very difficult circumstances compared to other parts of the world. How much better would we have been able to do if we actually took to heart some of, the, uh, some of the targets and some of the objectives was actually set out in Agenda 2063, which we set out when we first con constructed and conceptualized our, 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 our new institutions, uh, our new continental institutions in the early 2000s around, around governance. And we shouldn't actually undercut all of those and try to look for shortcuts. So one of the things at a continental level that worries me, uh, for example, is the fact that with the AU reforms, the, 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 the separate political departments and the, uh, and the peace and security are being merged. The one is much more powerful and clearly much more urgent than the other. But governance always tends to be seen as uh, something that you know, we'll get to because we need to, to deal with the fire. We need to put out the fire now, the war now, or whatever. But the two are so interconnected. It's in the same, in the same vein. Uh, with what Polanyi noted about about the about the economies and about and about resilience, and and for me, so there are no low hanging fruit, but actually we need to stick to. So if we look at it in the South African context and we talk about fighting corruption and so on and so forth, we need to enable and empower the institutions that can do that, so that the state actually has the fiscal resources and the fiscal space to be able to do that. And relatedly, however, of course, and this, this is not about what we can do, but we also have to really push through the AU and through, uh, uh, and through the G20 specifically, and these were discussions we had a couple of days ago, on, on some of the global issues that inhibit uh, also African resources and African fiscal space. And for me, the big, the big thing here is not only debt, but it's also the, the bigger issue of illicit financial flows which require some global regulations to actually help to empower African countries to have more resources than they have now because they lose them to, uh, to, the, uh, to the interesting tax havens in, in tropical islands. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, weaving together a number of issues there. I want to pick up on this issue of the global dimension. Uh, I noticed that our research uh, colleague who was part of this project with, with the ISS and ourselves at Gibbs uh, Dr. T.K. Pui is also among us as a participant today, and he's put a question here in the chat. Does COVID-19 highlight which international superstructure uh, the continent will go into? In other words, uh, will it pivot east towards China? Will it pivot west towards the U.S. or more north or to the middle towards the EU? Um, I, instead of speculating about that, I wonder if I could treat our uh, one of our, our friends here, um, Hans uh, 
Bueller as a panelist for a minute. And Hans, as a uh, participant in the dialogue as a European interested in the interests and the future of the continent, uh, what do you think the continent should do as it looks out beyond its borders? Of course, the easy answer is to work with Europe and uh, Germany in particular, but, but more strategically, how should it think about its relationships with the outside world? How do we make the best of those relationships? Hans? <laughs> Thank you, Marius. So thanks for this easy question, um, which is, of course, very difficult to answer for so someone who comes from Germany, which I have to admit. Um, but I think at the end, it comes down to, to the interest of Africa. And I think it's also sometimes uh, very difficult uh, very difficult just to say Africa uh, has one or two interests because it's such a diverse continent, of course, with, with more than 50 countries, which and all of them have different interests. And a similar, similar, uh, similar thing applies, of course, also for the European Union in this regard. I think what would be really important is for, for the African Union. And I think they, I mean, there is huge progress that has been achieved during the last couple of, of years uh, to make clear what uh, does the EU, what does Africa want and how, how could the partnership be de developed with the European Union? How could the partnership look like with, with China or the US? And then uh, decide for, for themselves what, what is important for the, for the African continent. I wonder, of course, sometimes if when we talk about capacity and um, I think Elizabeth brought it also up, the, the implementation capacity on the different levels um, if the European Union, um, now we, or the, at least it was supposed to happen, the EU, AU summit in October, uh, just this month, which was now postponed to the beginning of next year, of course, and you see the vast of, amount of topics the European Union, bring, Union brings to the table, I, I wonder sometimes if this really reflects at the end also the interest of the African Union. Yeah? When I listen to, to Dr. Ahmed, for example, when he says it's now really about to, to improve the health systems, it's about uh, debt, debt issues and uh, how to enable the states to regain um, revenues and so on and so forth. I think that a, a little bit of a focus maybe uh, or should, be, should be appropriate for all sides. Thank you, Hans. So there's an element there of, uh, as you put it, articulating one's interests, uh, creating an agenda, but then uh, finding the partnerships, developing the partnerships that speak to those. Thank you for picking up on that. And my, my question here to Dr. Ahmed, before we have some open mic discussion with pan, uh, participants, uh, Dr. Ahmed, one of the key observations around health, I think in the context of our research has been the way in which health has been at times neglected in favor of other conversations, governance conversations, economic growth conversations. But what the pandemic has shown us is that without health, uh, you can't have an economy. Without health, you can't have uh, stability and good governance. Health is a fundamental uh, public interest issue. Your thoughts on shifting the perspective on health, what needs to happen on the continent? How do we get ourselves to think differently about health as a more fundamental enabler of our development? Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Marius. Um, this, this, this pandemic actually has uh, brought uh, the whole conversation around investing in health uh, to the center. Um, many countries treat the health sector as um, a sector that it just consumes and um, it does not give back. But uh, we have seen how much the health sector can be able to give back when it is uh, properly um, uh, funded, when it is properly, um, uh, you know, resourced. Uh, because if it is properly resourced, it can be able to uh, respond quickly and uh, secure a country from um, uh, sliding uh, into um, uh, very huge numbers in terms of uh, cases and even, uh, uh, even deaths. So how do we do that? We do that by um, the space that we have um, occupied now during this pandemic, we need to ensure that we don't let go of it. And that means engaging with uh, all the three levels. You engage with the policymakers, you engage with technical colleagues, and you engage with the public so that everyone clearly understands that this investment gives back and it gives back in the form of when there's an emergency, it is available and it can be able to uh, secure 
uh, the health of uh, not just an individual or community, but also a country and a continent. So we must have um, uh, the conversation with all uh, the stakeholders within their own context uh, so that health is not relegated to just a service uh, a sector. Uh, health is truly an investment because without a, a healthy population, you cannot be able to do any of those other things that uh, we need to do. Second is uh, accountability at the continental, at the country, and at the sector level. Uh, these also need to be right at the center of our conversation. How do we hold um, our countries accountable on the continent in as far as investment in health is concerned? How do we hold our sectors uh, accountable uh, for the money that uh, they receive, the resources they receive? How are they using it? And how is that uh, improving health um, uh, to the population? And then accountability at the individual level. How disciplined are we so that when uh, public health measures have been put on the uh, on the table, we, we walk that path uh, to be able to protect ourselves and those who are um, uh, near to us. So that accountability needs also to be uh, uh, part of the conversation um, uh, using COVID-19 as a, a good context and uh, a good opportunity to be able to secure um, uh, the gains uh, that we have made. So these are the two ways I see we can be able to place it right at the center of our, of our conversation uh, from here uh, onwards. Uh, and, and finally is um, to have a plan that partners feed into. We should not wait for each partner to come with their own plan. We must have our plan and you fit into that plan. Uh, because otherwise you'll be chasing so many different projects and it will not be uh, coherent. We must have a plan and that plan is then supported by our friends, our neighbors, our partners uh, and our own selves. Uh, these are the three things that I will be able to say. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. I, I really appreciated the way you uh, spoke about framing health not as a cost, but as an investment and seeing the returns on that investment, a very powerful perspective there. Uh, I wonder if there's a, a question in the chat uh, from Jonathan Gunthorpe. Uh, Jonathan, I wonder if you wanted to ask that question. It is directed at Yucky, and it is about expanded public works programs, really thinking about building back the economy. If you'd like to unmute, uh, let's see if we can have you put that question to Yucky from your side. So I'm not hearing uh, Jonathan's question come through. Let me read it here in the chat. He says, Yucky, uh, I, I suspect there's supposed to be a question mark there to start. Time for continent-wide, REC-wide, Kinsey and expanded public works programs that focus on building back and development outcomes, employability and income, community-driven development. So essentially, what's the model we need for expanding economic growth that, that brings more people into the economy? Your thoughts, Yucky? Uh, thanks, Marius. Um, you know, short question uh, with uh, that is quite challenging. Um, I always view the um, the economy as um, a train, and the the engine that drives that uh, train is uh, your formal sector, uh, with formal sector employment. And the more rapidly you can grow your economy, the more rapidly you can grow formal sector employment. But the reality is that a large portion of Africa uh, is in the informal economy. These are people that are surviving. Um, and you have to um, provide people in the informal sector with uh, social grants and uh, lower the barriers of entry to the informal sector. And then the third carriage in this uh, train are the people that are not economically active, that are not... And for them, you have to provide public work programs. Um, and one of the challenges that we face is whereas, for example, social grants is a very positive factor in alleviating deep-seated poverty and inequality, we are in a country like South Africa over extended periods of time creating a culture of uh, dependence, whereas what you should be doing is uh, creating, empowering people, because development is actually about creating independence, empowering people. It's not about creating dependence. And uh, uh, that empowerment, which you clearly see, uh, you see that entrepreneurship in certain countries, but certainly not in other countries. So how do we get this train to move along? Uh, when we speak about the implementation of the African continental free trade area, 
we often talk about the lack of infrastructure and, and that we need to build all of those things. But very often the main problems in the implementation of the African continental free trade area and other things is the so-called non-tariff barriers. These are the bureaucracy, the vested interests in uh, tariffs between countries. And these things are, are matters of governance that can be uh, resolved. Uh, many of us have spoken about um, uh, uh, the importance of building institutions, Elizabeth in particular, and so on, very important. Uh, but um, in a certain sense, uh, development is about institutionalization. But we can today uh, leapfrog some of the problems that we have with bureaucracy by uh, leapfrogging and using digitization and modern technology to, for example, provide every African with a physical address. Uh, you don't need a, a post, you can do it through uh, um, uh, G GPS and other systems by providing every African with an ID system, an ID number. And uh, through those, you can provide them, for example, the social grants and so on. So modern technology uh, provides huge ways in which Africa can uh, leapfrog. We've just finished a study on, on the DRC. And in actual fact, our recommendation on the DRC is forget about Grand Inga. It does nothing, it will do nothing for the DRC. Like the uh, oil and gas or the gas in Northern Mozambique, it will do nothing for ordinary Mozambicans. It will do a lot for a number of foreign consultants and foreign companies. But what we should be doing is investing in the provision of uh, particularly electricity by using renewables distributed systems and looking after the human capital, which is what we've been discussing, improving your human capital by providing people access to electricity using dispersed mini grid and off grid solutions can do much more for Africa's development sometimes in certain instances, not always, than investing in, in big uh, infrastructure projects. So I've sort of leapt, uh, leapfrogged <laughs> or jumped from one area to another to uh, particularly make the point about the importance of the opportunity that Africa has if we have the right leadership to use modern technology to drag us in the, into the formal sector and uh, to accelerate the development of African states and accelerate our entire uh, modernization trajectory. Thank you, Yaki. Uh, it, in fact, it links very nicely to a comment that we have in the chat here, again by Junior, who says uh, he wants to add to what Hans says, that what we need in Africa are smart partnerships. Uh, for example, a made in Africa partnership. Instead of exporting raw materials, we partner with foreign entities who have the technology and the expertise to manufacture the finished goods on the continent for sale on the continent. Of course, there are limits to that, given the size of Africa's uh, markets from an income point of view but also tremendous opportunity for, for con those, those markets to move up uh, to become higher uh, uh, consumption markets. And this links to a earlier question, and I'll for a moment here just take my uh, moderator's hat off and put on a, a panelist's hat. An earlier question, which was, uh, what about the fact that the pandemic, particularly in the case of the US, led to a wealth increase for the super rich and often job losses and lower incomes for the poor or uh, you know, middle classes. What about that dynamic in Africa? It is the case, and we've seen this in our research, that the pandemic accentuated the structural nature of African economies. So by way of example, an economy in Tunisia that is service orientated, uh, that has high levels of unemployed skilled people, saw very high levels of unemployed, uh, unemployment rising because of the st structure of that economy versus an economy, for instance, in Chad, that is a, a low income economy where people are on subsistence, uh, saw high levels of fundamental vulnerability in the form of food insecurity or health insecurity, but not an increase in job losses because people are living in subsistence at the, at the poverty level. And so the structure of the economy leads to particular kinds of vulnerability. And this brings us back to the point that Yaki is making, and that's in the research, in the report, that really what Africa needs to do is rethink the structure of our economies and think about how do we move from uh, very wealthy, centralized services economies in our cities, for instance, whether it's Lagos or Johannesburg, with very vast uh, people groups in poverty and dependency, how do we move that across into an economy that is more productive uh, with, with sectors in agriculture, agro-processing, manufacturing, infrastructure building and other forms of industry 
that can absorb those, particularly the young Africans, into those productive sectors, get them engaged in the economy. And then, of course, the intra-Africa trade is part of that story. Now, to do that, we need the rule of law, we need governance. But as Yaki has explained, we need to remove the barriers uh, at the market level, the market structure level, at the trade level, that will allow for the investment to flow. And this links lastly to a question here that I think Seth Micah had about what about the well-being of Africans? Uh, we have to think about the, the social well-being, uh, the justice, the human rights. But in many ways, those outcomes are fundamentally linked to the economic progress. Uh, it's very difficult, almost impossible to have progress in well-being without progress in economic terms. And so really a need for some development and investment in those areas. I see an important comment here by Hans. Uh, we have not talked much about the elephant in the room, uh, debts. Uh, if there is a lack of political and proper governance, as mentioned by the speakers, how will Africa make sure that the international funding is wise, wisely used? What would you recommend to the international community, the IWF, the World Bank, etc.? Let me, let me have a moment here, an open mic to our panelists, popcorn style. Anyone want to take on uh, Hans's important question about governing our debt management? Um, let me make a, a few comments and maybe Elizabeth and others would, would, would come in on that. I made the, uh, one of our key findings, uh, which is now unfortunately occurring, is that uh, with Africa's growth declining, what was very high levels of debt um, uh, going into the crisis um, has now become a debt crisis. So the first thing is that the, and this will be the proposal at the G20 meeting, that the, Afri that the debt standstill at least be extended for a year. But there are going to be certain countries that are going to require debt forgiveness. Um, and this presents the international community with, with huge challenges. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't help at the moment to, to argue that um, the debt we have created, uh, a debt bubble, maybe in a degree from, from China. Somebody's got to come and build the infrastructure. Europe and North America is not going to build the infrastructure. China was prepared to do it. Um, so I think one of the challenges that we, that we, are, that we need to face going forward um, in the G20 and others is to create a, a common understanding, and including transparency, on our debt situation and what uh, needs to be done uh, to assist in that. And one of the key measures here is to try and find a way of dealing with the extent to which Africa uh, pays significantly higher uh, premiums on its debt than other regions uh, due to historical misperceptions or perceptions about the continent. So I think that debt is, is going to be a big issue and it's going to um, potentially punish Africa because not only will we, uh, <clears throat> we are going to be hit by the associated um, negative ratings that will come with uh, debt forgiveness in particular. And this is something that I think really uh, concerns anybody that is working on the continent. Unfortunately, uh, the international community will have to come to the table on this, but so will African governments, because we have to commit uh, in a responsible way of dealing with the uh, support that we are going to uh, potentially get. We can't carry on uh, having these uh, debt crises every um, you know, 10, 15 years. Although, of course, uh, we are hit with COVID, which we had no role in. Uh, we, we are hit by the result of that. Um, and and uh, the impact is obviously much worse when, when you are poor countries as much as, as we are. I'll stop there. Thank you, Yaki. Elizabeth, I wonder if you want to add to that one quick uh, segue from me on that. Uh, the, the fact that Africa is vulnerable financially, fiscally, and dependent on debt can potentially play into a populist narrative that we have a particular relationship with the outside world and that the power relations of that are unfortunate and should be avoided. Uh, yet, uh, we have few choices. Any thoughts on, on, uh, in response to that and the general discussion? Yeah. Um, so, let me just uh, make a couple of points around around debt and, and, and to say uh, the, the debt that we're facing debt from China. It's also private sector, uh, 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 private sector debt. Um, um, not private sector debt, um, but it's from, it's, you know, raising in the capital and uh, the capital markets, not just the bilateral uh, debt and, and debt from multilateral development banks. And that's, that's what's quite different from 
say the uh, the processes uh, on 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 debt and HIPEC sort of uh, from from 2005 and Glen Eagles, and so that creates an issue here around countries' credit ratings. Uh, so some countries have have actually actively not decided to join the DSSI, the debt service rescheduling a standstill uh, uh, initiative because it it affects their uh, 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 potentially their credit rating. Private sector creditors are not part of the uh, uh, not part of that initiative. It's been voluntary, and they've they've opted out of it. And so the the debt issues that Africa and other developing countries are facing today are very different from and much more complex than than we were facing uh, 20 years ago. And so the actors uh, are, are many are, are many more, and therefore much more difficult to rally. And I think uh, the AU has, has, has also tried to engage with private sector creditors uh, on, 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 on some relief, but I, I don't think that's gone, that's gone very far. And China, of course, has a different way of understanding public sector uh, 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 debt. Uh, it's bilateral debt versus uh, some of the debt that is issued what, by what we understand to be public institutions, but which China sees as not part of its, of its formal official uh, bilateral uh, arrangement. So I think what this all says is that we actually really, in terms of global rules, really need to rethink, not because it affects Africa, but because it, it affects many parts of the world. We actually really need to think about the way in which sovereign debt uh, is regulated and structured. And, and isn't it really time now to push forward uh, on, a, on a global sovereign debt restructuring uh, framework. We saw the challenges uh, that Argentina uh, uh, was facing also around private, uh, uh, private sector debt. And I think really that is something that should be on the agenda of the G20. That's highly sensitive and highly difficult. But I mean, we do need a new paradigm. Uh, somebody put in the chat, you know, what does that mean about for South Africa in terms of the NDP, in terms of sustainable development goals? COVID, the COVID pandemic has put all of those at risks, risk, and it has forced us, I think, I hope, to really rethink our entire financing model. Um, so the point that uh, I think Yaki made about, uh, you know, it actually disproportionately affects uh, African countries, absolutely. I mean, it's the inadequacy of a, of a global financial safety net that makes it much more expensive for those who actually need the money. You know, it's like you go to the bank and you, when you need the money, the bank says it's not gonna give it to you. Well, it's exactly the same for Africa. We need to really rethink. In the same way that we're talking about rethinking a, the globalization paradigm, we also really need to rethink the global fin financing paradigm, whether it is about MDBs or about uh, around so sovereign debt. Then you talked about the issue and, and, and related to that is of course the illicit financial flows. Because when we're talking about really constrained fiscal spaces, and the latest UNCTAD report shows that nearly $90 billion leaves the continent every year in illicit financial flows, that's a bit of the fiscal space uh, that, uh, that could have been covered. Um, in terms of the, I suppose one of the, uh, the, the, one of the challenges that I think the world is going to face is uh, in, in, the, in the wake of the COVID pandemic is exactly this, uh, this ability to play uh, the populist card when uh, if conditions, uh, if economic conditions in countries become much more austere. And we can see that also playing out in, in, in the South African context, which is why it is so important that actually we do engage on these global rules uh, because these, this is the global superstructure that, that countries that are now trying to simply make ends meet in, in, in a COVID environment are really going to battle uh, to deal with. I mean, you know, we're facing strikes in South Africa in terms of public sector wage increases. I mean, our fiscus cannot sustain it, uh, but that will play into a narrative unless we work together with the international community, uh, firstly, in creating some short-term relief, which is absolutely the point that Yaki says, that actually delaying some of the initiatives uh, to uh, extending some of them to beyond 2020, 2021, or even 2022, I would argue. And then actually reconvening and thinking about the way in which we do finance globally and the rules that govern it and the extent to which that these support or not uh, developing economies, because ultimately that also affects the rest of the world. The, the health of, develop, of the developing world will affect uh, the health of the industrialized world as well. Thank you, Elizabeth. I wonder if we could extend that 
that theme uh, one level further. Uh, Filani, you're of course uh, very much focused on this global geostrategic environment. Um, a lot of people have, have termed our environment the new normal, but we don't yet know what that normal is going to be. Uh, prior to COVID, we had trade wars. Uh, we had a more polarized, multipolar world rather than a unipolar world. Uh, where do you see the, the, the continent lying, the groupings lying when the dust has settled post-COVID? Any thoughts for you beyond uh, the tactical small issues of, of the financial system, the broader geostrategic environment within which, of course, Africa will need to navigate? Uh, any thoughts on that? And then we'll come to some of the other issues in the, in the chat. Excellent. Um, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, you know, earlier in the year, I think we, we started the year, we, we published um, a book and Elizabeth also participated in that book, which looked at actually Africa at the center. So looking at Africa from a geostrategic, uh, you know, point of view, um, and I'm trying to understand how better the continent needs to be engaging with the world. I mean, before COVID, one thing we need to take into account is that there was a growing number of new actors who wanted to have certain engagements with the continent uh, through various summit uh, frameworks. So China through the Forum on Africa, uh, China Cooperation, you have India through the India Africa Forum summits, you have Turkey, you have South Korea, you have Japan, um, you have a whole range of, 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 of actors that have been actively looking to forge partnerships with the continent. Now, what is fortunate for the continent is that Africa has pronounced on how it should engage um, with uh, um, uh, strategic uh, partners, external partners. And there is a robust debate happening within the continent on how the continent should actually engage with these external actors um, to sort of go beyond the concept of the one and the many, where you have an external power, um, you know, every three years, uh, four years, meeting with all of Africa's um, uh, heads of state. And, 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 and there are very important discussions now on actually reformulating such partnerships and, and, and getting a stronger role for the African Union in terms of coordination. If you just look at uh, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, you now have an AU office in Beijing, um, in addition you know, to some of the embassies, uh, the African embassies in Beijing. That adds an additional layer of uh, coordination when it comes to the continent and uh, um, sort of coordinating and, and, and moving strategically through its international engagements. And that goes back, I think, to what was said earlier, is that in the continent's engagements with external actors, their frameworks need to align to Africa's already agreed priorities. Now, the continent has agreed on certain priorities. They've been articulated in Agenda 2063. They've been articulated through the 10-year uh, implementation plans of Agenda 2063. And it's clear that there is a growing uh, awareness within the continent that it needs to do a better job at managing its partnerships. Um, because some of those partnerships do not necessarily enhance um, um, Africa's agency and the nature of some of those partnerships. So there's an increasing look, I think, and that answers the question of where Africa aligns. The continent is trying to say we don't have to align. We are being courted by external actors. And if we want to maximize our engagement with these external actors, we need greater cohesion within the continent. What's been encouraging is that in the last uh, two, three years or so, you are now having also greater coordination or at least the initial stages of trying to have better coordination between the African Union and the regional economic communities. And I think if we can really build on that, you know, then we will have a situation where the continent does act more cohesively. 
because we have you know, enough evidence to show that when Africa acts with greater cohesion, that there is greater agency and it is able to achieve more in the international landscape. And I also think it ends up being actually beneficial to our engagement with external actors. Um, I mean, I was just, and this is the last point, I was just wa uh, watching recently a debate uh, uh, with the European uh, Commissioner, I think, for uh, competition policy. And she was saying that in, 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 in terms of managing how Europe engages with your big tech companies, um, what Europe is trying to do is to really create a, you know, a, a single sort of regulatory framework of how Europe can better protect consumers, but also ensure that they also, you know, uh, encourage competition. And I think, you know, there's important lessons there for the continent in a sense that you can achieve more if you increase your level of engagement, your level of cohesion. And, 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 and hopefully with that, minimize, you know, the worst impacts of uh, COVID-19. And I mean, what Elizabeth was saying is that we're essentially an, sort of a net exporter of, uh, of, 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 of capital, you know, with these illicit financial flows. We always think of Africa as a recipient uh, of aid. And if we can really plug those big holes, we can increase African agency, we can take care of some of this debt situation uh, that we've been talking about because we do have resources, but they need to be channeled and they need to be governed uh, more effectively and more efficiently. Thank you, uh, Dr. Filani. I knew you would have a, a, a wonderful answer to that question and you've, uh, you've over exceeded my expectations. Uh, colleagues, we have just under 10 minutes left and we're going to end promptly on the hour as we committed to do, but I want to come to Dr. Ahmed first for a, with a question. Uh, and then, uh, Dr. Ahmed, if you, once you've answered the question, if you'd like to make a closing remark for a minute or a minute and a half or so, uh, whatever you feel comfortable doing. The question was put in the chat by Anna Skosana, who asks very insightfully, we've seen the increase of COVID cases in Europe after the reopening of economies during the summer holiday. South Africa's entering its spring or summer has allowed international flights and level one lockdown. Um, what are the main concerns or challenges facing us, and, and I'm going to extend that question beyond South Africa to Africa. Uh, we were caught off guard unexpectedly by the pandemic. Are we at risk of another shock? How should we think about the health and, and pandemic risk going forward? And then your closing remarks, and then we'll go uh, to the other panelists, if I may. Uh, no, th thanks, Marius, and uh, thanks um, uh, to the question. Um, the, the, the guidance that we are giving is really very simple. And um, it is around the ability to test, to trace, and then you secure those who have the virus so they don't spread it. And um, uh, those three simple steps um, are very complex to, uh, to implement, but they're really the three simple steps. So as we open up um, our borders and we um, start to ramp up our economic activities, there's going to be a lot of interaction. And uh, we are encouraging countries that public health measures, there is no um, vaccine that will replace a disciplined individual who takes care of their space. And this needs to be communicated clearly to the public so they know that they have the responsibility to themselves to be able to ensure their space is um, uh, secured from um, uh, uh, transmission of this virus. So as the borders open, uh, the campaign that we have, uh, uh, we rolled out um, uh, early this, this week was to ensure that there is confidence in travel so that people can travel a little more. And the only way to make sure that there's confidence in travel is to have confidence in the certification of um, testing. Uh, so it means we must have labs that are doing the right thing. We do proper quality um, uh, assessment to, to be sure that what when it's a negative test is a negative test. If it's positive, it's positive. So the labs need to be doing the right things. Second is that the information that the lab receives can be transmitted to the authorities at the border points, whether it is land, sea, or, uh, or air, though many times we focus mostly on airports. 
that uh, the vast majority of travelers actually go through uh, land uh, border posts. So um, the integrity of the test needs to be secured at the border point, and we've launched a platform for that. The third thing is that the systems within each and every country, and this is where solidarity becomes important, and um, uh, President Ramaphosa, as um, uh, chair of the union, has really driven this point home of solidarity, and the heads of state meet on a very regular basis um, uh, during this pandemic period, giving us guidance on what we need to do. So the solidarity of uh, the neighbors in Africa needs to be seen in the way that they act when um, a problem has been identified. So the measures being done in country A are reflective of the measures being done in country B. That way we don't get um, uh, a mismatch in the sort of uh, public health measures that are being put in place and the veracity of implementing them. So we are saying that um, uh, test well um, uh, and then have your health system ready for any spike in the numbers. Um, and um, uh, countries should really not shy away uh, from um, uh, ensuring that um, the health system starts from the point of entry all the way to the ICU if it is required. But most of the things that we need to do need to be done at the personal level, at the level where uh, members of the public are meeting and um, at the level where the, the, the public health system particularly, uh, but in this case, including the private health system are ready for any numbers that are going to go up. So these are the things that we need to do to gain confidence uh, so that people can be able to travel more. And that travel should not be risky. It should be the type of travel that actually uh, gives us um, uh, confidence that we are not spreading uh, the virus. Now for my closing, I would like to say only one thing, that we are the vaccine as individuals. We are the ones who are going to stop the transmission of the virus or we are the ones who are going to keep on transmitting it. Personal discipline is going to be extremely important because now we have um, many more people who have the virus. Uh, we have it circulating in our communities. So we are the vaccine and it is our personal discipline uh, that is going to ensure uh, that the transmission is interrupted um, until we get uh, to a point where we can get a vaccine um, uh, that is affordable enough uh, for uh, uh, the world to be able to, uh, to use. So we are the vaccine and it's our personal discipline that is going to interrupt transmission of this virus. Thank you. Dr. Omar, thank you for that. I could feel uh, us being given our marching orders and uh, thank you for your clear, <laughs> direct communication there. Uh, very, very useful indeed. Uh, Dr. Yaki Salias, a final thought from you before we go to Vilani. Um, thanks, uh, Marius, and thanks for facilitating an excellent discussion. I would simply concur with what Dr. Omar said. And uh, on the one side, we need to learn to live with uh, COVID. Um, and uh, I think that that is really what he is saying. We, uh, the damage that COVID has uh, caused in Africa has largely been because of its economic impacts. Mortality levels are low. Uh, mortality levels are not the main driver of, uh, of our problem. It is, we need to get the African economies uh, going again. And to do that, we need to live responsibly uh, with COVID. And uh, I think that that's in a simple way is maybe just reiterating the point that, that Dr. Uma uh, has made. Um, COVID has, uh, has done Africa significant uh, damage. Our estimation is that this year, we will see a reduction in Africa's GDP of about $200 billion, uh, which is massive. And the impact of that is what we saw in the video. Uh, we have to simply um, learn to live with it, with it, with the disease, um, and to reopen our economies and uh, to make our economies COVID resistant. So thank you very much to you, Marius, and to the fellow panelists. Thank you, Yaki, uh, Dr. Matembu. Uh, final word from you, and then uh, Elizabeth, you'll take us home. Uh, thank you, uh, Marius, and thank you for facilitating this discussion. Uh, it's really been great. Um, I think just uh, in a few seconds, I mean, my really last uh, point is just that on the health side, I think COVID-19 has highlighted that whilst the continent does have very strong vulnerabilities, it is also more resilient 
than others um, actually give it credit sometimes. And I think that goes to some of what uh, also some of uh, uh, Yaki when it comes to when it when we talk about risk analysis. I think the world also we need to also uh, sort of redefine how we also perceive risk on the continent, but also the world also needs to better understand how to factor in certain risk measures that are better adaptable uh, within our um, uh, context. And then I think it's, it, it's a matter of just building that resilience. I think the fact that we haven't been hit as hard as the other regions of the world has to allow the continent to move ahead in terms of building regional value chains, but also in terms of building resilience at a regional level. Things like tourism have been hit. Let's increase the tourism within the region. Um, trade has been hit. Let's increase the trade you know, within the region. Let's use it to catalyze some of Africa's already existing priorities, such as um, the African continental free trade area. Because if we prioritize those uh, agreed to priorities, we will be more resilient than we were even for the next uh, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Villani. Uh, Elizabeth? Um, one last remark that is to say that, you know, crises can create actually opportunities for transformation. And this year we're also celebrating 75 years of the establishment of the UN that came after uh, one of the most terrific uh, wars uh, I think humanity has ever gone through. And I think for Africa now, and indeed for the world, but let's focus on Africa, I think the, what, what the pandemic has created in terms of the social and economic uh, uh, crisis actually creates an opportunity for us to really uh, take advantage of the crisis and actually begin to transform our economies and our social systems and the way in which what we have been talking about for you know, for many, many decades uh, uh, about uh, more effective governance and development, actually we can take the right steps together, not just uh, in, in pockets, uh, to actually realize Agenda 2063. This is the time. Let's use this transformatively. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, I'll quote uh, the uh, Akram there in the chat that says, very inspiring and valuable discussion. Um, certainly feels that way to me. It's my great joy to say thank you once again to our funders, Hans Heidel Foundation, Humanity United, who made the, entire, the overall project possible. Of course, to our panelists uh, who've generously given up their time today and engaged, being present, really insightful contributions. Uh, to the support team, uh, JD McGibe on the Gibbs side, Zashal and others on the ISA side that have worked in the background to make today possible. We thank you for your efforts uh, always. And then last but not least, of course, to our, our, our attendees and our uh, participants, thank you for being with us. Thank you for the great questions. And I'll end in the last 10 seconds by reading what uh, Callisto Mongoni put into the chat, in fact, when he said, how our nations will recover will be a direct function of the quality and the quantity of our investments in recovery. It cannot be business as usual. We need to rebuild, recover, and build resilience and some sort of self-sufficiency. So thank you, uh, Kalisa. I couldn't have uh, summarized it better myself. Thank you, everyone. And we hope to see you at our next discussion. All the best. <laughs>